Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. Want to dive right into your questions. Super excited to get into, into them this Sunday evening. Before we do, I want to remind you to go to rebelcapitalistlive.com and get your tickets to the most incredible investment conference in human history. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> That's a heck of a guarantee, isn't it? It's going to be this May 12th to the 14th in Orlando. You got to check out some of these speakers. I think this is just an incredible just one of the best lineups I've ever seen. Well, it's definitely one of the best lineups I've created for Rebel Capitalist Live event. And this is going to be our fourth one. We've got Mike Maloney, Peter Schiff, Robert Barnes, Kenny McElroy, Chris McIntosh, Jason Hartman, Lynn Alden, Simon Black, MC is going to be Robert Helms from the Real Estate Guys, Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, Bob Murphy, and this guy. He might have something to say. Maybe a thing or two. So anyway, you got to check it out. It's going to be incredible. I think the best part of this event is just meeting your fellow rebel capitalists, getting a chance to network and just feed off of that energy. And uh, if you're someone that's kind of worried about a recession, you know that there's that economic tsunami that's coming our direction. We talk about that in the videos all the time. You are concerned with the overreach of government, central bank digital currencies. You're concerned with this infringement, this encroachment on your freedom, liberty, privacy, free market capitalism. This is a perfect event. And I know a lot of you in the comments always say, okay, George, I know the problems, but I need the answers. I need the solutions. What do I do? And the first step that you can take is go to Rebel Capitalist Live, and you're going to get some incredible insights. It's going to help you prepare not only for whatever we have coming in 2023 from a financial standpoint, but also from a standpoint of personal freedom and liberty. All right, let's get into your questions. ASAP, what do we got here? Would you dump Anheuser-Busch stock? That's a good question. Would I personally, I think that's what you're asking. Would I personally dump the stock? I mean, I wouldn't have bought it in the first place. If I owned it, would I? Mm, I mm, I probably would. But I don't know that I would do it just because they've just completely derailed and you know now promoting kind of a this trans agenda, if you will. Uh you know, they're a company. Let them do what they want, but they got to suffer the consequences. Uh if the free market's allowed to work. The consumers are going to choose what they want and what type of marketing message they want to hear. I, so I don't know that I'd, from a principled standpoint, I don't know that I would dump the stock, assuming that the fundamentals were good. But I would probably dump the stock from a, well, let me rephrase that. From a principled standpoint, I, I probably would not dump the stock just based on them doing something from a marketing standpoint, I, I thought was kind of just not in line with my worldview. But uh, um, I would dock, I would dump their stock from a standpoint of fundamentals, fundamental reasons. So why? Okay, well, part of the fundamental analysis you do on a company is obviously their balance sheet, but it's also their management team. So if you've got a management team that is this disconnected, from reality. I, on Twitter the other day, I tweeted out something, I can't remember the exact words, but I basically said, if you're someone that can't understand, you know, why Bud Light's core is upset with this type of marketing message, just go ahead and imagine that Sephora hired Alex Jones to market their makeup. I mean, think about what, the, I mean, the mainstream media would lose their minds and their customer base, most likely not big Alex Jones fans or Donald Trump, something like that. So it's basically the equivalent. And, you know, does, can Sephora hire Donald Trump? Sure, go nuts. I, I, I don't really care. But as a, a shareholder, assuming they're a publicly traded company, would I sit back and be, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. Is their management team that daft? Is their management team that obtuse? And if so, do I really want to hold the shares 
of a company that's just going to have a marketing whiff that's that bad? I mean, this is just common sense stuff here. I get it. They're trying to market to a younger demographic. They're trying to do X, Y, and Z. I, I get that argument. But the bottom line is they are just absolutely clueless when it comes to their base. And that's probably why I dumped the stock. Okay, do you think this is the beginning of the end game? No. Probably not. I think that 20, 2008 was probably the beginning of the end game. And we're just that the inning number two or three, something like that. Because the, the end game, to me most likely, is the breakdown of the global monetary system. I mean, if you don't have a global monetary system that's functioning properly, you're, you're not going to have a global economy that's running on all eight cylinders. It's, it's just not going to work. So they patched it together with duct tape and spit and kind of, you know, it's like a crack in the dam and there's putting one finger there, one finger there, one thumb there, one toe there and you know, doing all these things. But at the end of the day, that, that dam is most likely going to break to a point where they're not going to be able to fix it. No matter how much QE they do, no matter how much fiscal, it's just going to make the matter worse. And you, you, what is the catalyst? I, I don't know, but it's most likely a, a deterioration or a outright failure of the global monetary system. And I think that started in 2008. But I think what your question is, is are we at the end game as far as this next recession or that economic tsunami that's coming our way that the yield curve has been warning about? And uh, yeah, I, I think definitely. But what I would do there, Jim, just to give you some insight or some, like a tip to kind of time it a little bit better, not that this is perfect. And again, there's no certainties, only probabilities. But if you look back throughout history, going back to the 1950s, you see that the problem usually hits the fan when the curve is no longer inverted between the twos and the tens. So the two-year yield, 10-year yield, watch that like a hawk. So when that two-year yield goes back down under the 10-year, and that's most likely going to happen via the Fed rate cuts, that's over the next six months, that's when there's the highest probability that you get that stuff hitting the fan moment. And uh, for my personal portfolio, that's exactly what I'm watching. So, and that's what I'm going to be watching with the live streams on the Rebel Capitals channel. I'm sure I'll be doing more whiteboard videos. And that's just super easy. Anybody can do it. Just watch the yield between the two-year and the 10-year. There are many currencies pegged to the U.S. Uh, dollar countries can trade in native currencies, but those country, countries are converted to USD Anyone, what's, hmm, not sure that's a question. There's many currencies pegged to the U.S. dollar, okay? Countries can trade in native currencies, but those currencies are converted to U.S. dollars for pricing. Anyone, what say you? I believe the dollar stays in power. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I think we're in the process of the dollar losing reserve currency status, but that takes decades. That doesn't happen in days or weeks or months or something like that. So, it, you know, it happened to the dollar, or excuse me, it happened to the British pound in 1920s. And it was just a result. It didn't come from top down, like a government coming in and say, no more British pounds. You know, people think that's what happened in 1944, but it's not. The, the, the British pound was slowly deteriorating. It was slowly losing its power going all the way back to the 1920s. Why? Because the United States economy just kept growing and growing and growing. And if you're a business that's outside the United States and you want to do business with a customer in the U.S., then you're going to want to hold a little bit of some dollars. So it's just a, a slow, gradual process. And I think we're just seeing it right now and maybe inning two or three and probably see it play out over the next at least decade or two. 
if deposits are leaving banks and going to money market funds, doesn't this mean more strict lending, which can further crush balance sheets? Yeah. I mean, tightening of lending standards, if you want to look at it that way, for sure. So, I mean, just to be clear, we've got bank reserves that are on the Fed's balance sheets that are assets of these banks. And if that customer with a deposit says, hey, I want my deposit to go into a money market fund, and that uh, institutional, it's got to be institutional, money market fund. Uh, well, I guess it doesn't. Uh, technically for M2 it does, but let's forget about M2 because we're just looking at the Fed's balance sheet. So then that money market fund takes the deposit from the customer, takes, moves it to reverse repo, and then those bank reserves go from the uh, reserve accounts of the commercial banking system in aggregate total all the way down to the reverse or up or wherever it goes. On my whiteboards, I always put it below. So it goes into the reverse repo account. So that is effectively quantitative tightening. There, there are fewer, without the Fed decreasing the size of their balance sheet, there would then be fewer bank reserves. Now, I don't know that the banks are really constrained by reserves, um, especially with, what, $3 trillion still in the system. But uh, they are constrained when it comes to confidence in counterparties. That's the way I like to look at it. Because if a, if a, if a bank wants to create dollars, they'll create dollars. You know, if, a, if they wanted to create dollars to bail out Silicon Valley Bank, they would have done that. Uh, they would not have had to go to the Fed or you know, whatever. Just name your bailout. So the balance sheets are constrained, are not constrained from that standpoint. But what is uh, constrained from a standpoint of lending is the confidence that someone's going to pay you back. So when there's very low confidence that someone's going to pay you back, you need a lot of reserves in the system. With very high confidence, then you don't need many reserves at all. And the best example of that I can give is prior to 2008 and 2007, most of you guys know from watching my videos, that the entire banking system only had about $40 billion with a B in bank reserves. Now they have $3 trillion plus. I haven't looked at it lately. I don't know if it's three or four trillion, but it's it's a hell of a lot higher than forty billion. <laughs> uh, but M two has gone up, but I haven't gone up that much, right? And so another great example I always use is in 1980 they had forty billion in reserves, but 1.5 trillion in M two, and in 2007 they had forty billion in reserves, not one dime more than they had in 1980, but yet M two had gone from 1.5 trillion up to 7.5 trillion. So that, that just goes to show you right there that the banks are going to expand their balance sheet regardless of what's happening with reserves. Another thing that you guys might find interesting, and I actually should do a whiteboard video on this because very few people realize it. Most, even the talking heads on CNBC and the quote unquote experts, they believe that the Fed creates the amount of reserves based on how much liquidity they want to provide or based on how much lending they want to see in the real economy. So if they want to decrease lending, well, they'll just go ahead and create fewer reserves. They'll take liquidity out of the system. And that's going to put disinflationary pressures on the economy or, or vice versa, right? They want to increase inflation. They're going to pump in more reserves, uh, more reserves. The bank's going to lend more because they got more balance sheet capacity, blah, 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 blah. You guys know the story, right? You hear it every single day on CNBC. But in reality, it's the opposite. The Fed does not create reserves. And then the banks lend around how many reserves are in the system. That's the view of 99%, even of the experts. And like I said, it's completely the opposite. Meaning that the banks lend to whoever they want to lend to. The banks lend, forget the reserve requirements, forget any of that stuff. Basel III might impact a little bit, but I think they've got ways around that. Banks lend, and then the Fed creates reserves around how many loans the banks are created, therefore, or creating, therefore, how many reserves they need. Now, right now, this isn't applicable because we're in the age of quantitative easing when they're absolutely flushed with reserves. But you go back to, let's say, 2006, prior to that, before we did QE, when they would try to micromanage the overnight rate just by doing little bursts of buying, little bursts of selling, and try to get that rate where they wanted it, right? The Fed funds rate. So what would happen 
is they the, the the New York Fed, the trading desk, they would look at and they would talk to the banks and they would try to determine how many loans they were going to create over the next quarter. And then what they would do is they would say, okay, where do we want the rate? And then they'd say, okay, well, how many reserves do we need to create in order to give the banking system enough reserves so they can meet their reserve requirements based on how many loans they're going to create? And you say, George, this is completely contrary to every single thing that I've heard in the mainstream media, every single textbook, every single blah, 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 blah. All the experts, all the gurus that I listen to, this is this flies in the face of what they say. They say the reverse is true. In fact, they base almost their entire worldview on macro <laughs> that the reverse is true. So why should I believe you? Don't believe me. Don't. Just believe the Fed. So what I mean by that is I've gone back and read blog posts. I've read papers that the Fed themselves wrote summarizing, and they do this every year. They have this summary report, uh, well, at least they used to prior to QE, where they would say, this year we were doing this, 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 and this, and they would kind of outline what they did the entire year to manage open market operations or to manage how they would, uh, or to summarize, give you details on how they would, a detailed summary, on how they would get the rate, the Fed funds rate, how they would keep it in their range or keep it at that specific number prior to quantitative easing. And they say over and over and over again that they don't that they don't create the reserves and then the banks lend. They say the banks lend and then they try to figure out how many reserves they need to satisfy the banks. And then that's how many reserves they create. They, the Fed says this over and over and over and over again. Why nobody listens to them I don't know. And even in the bank, the bank of England has said this in their 2014 paper that I reference in tons of my whiteboard videos. And you can just Google. It's like, I forgot the name of it, but just Google bank of England, um, monetary system, 2014 PDF, something like that. And it'll pop right up. You can read it yourself. And they say the exact same thing. They say they just, the, the banks lend and then the central bank creates the reserves to match that lending. So anyway, I know that was a tangent, but I think it's very important that you realize, and I say this over and over and over and over again, and now maybe you'll realize why I say this, is when you look at the monetary solar system, the Fed, ooh, some, I don't know if you guys heard that thunder, that was, wow, geez, that's some pretty severe thunderstorm here. But anyway, uh, if you look at the monetary solar system, everybody thinks the Fed is the sun. And all the banks kind of revolve around the Fed, just like the planets. When in reality, it's the complete opposite. If we look at that monetary solar system, the sun is not the Federal, uh, the Federal Reserve of the Central Bank. The sun is the commercial banking system. And the central banks are the planets that revolve around them. All right. If you had a W-2, would you escape and achieve financial? How would you escape? Oh, I would just start creating content around something I loved and I would do that just at nights and on the weekends. And I would just try to grow that little side business online slowly. It doesn't happen overnight, but, uh, I would just, you know, if you can start making a thousand bucks a month and then based on your income right now is eight grand. So I would just keep building that up and you do that for three or four years. And, uh, if you do it well, and stick to it and use just smart proven strategies, then you're gonna be making eight grand a month on your side hustle. I'm saying after you know a few years of doing this, and then you can decide whether you just wanna focus on the side hustle, quit your job and continue to grow that business because that gives you the freedom and flexibility of their schedule, or if you wanna just continue doing both. That's how I'd kind of transition from one to the other. Were you serious last time you were saying you're not opposed to having kids? but it's harder to find the right gal in your fifties or just know a very, I just know a very nice Christian gal about 10, 15. <laughs> well, I appreciate you trying to set me up. <laughs> uh, that's very kind, but yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much everyone's view guy or gal. 
I say, sure, I'd like to have kids. You just got to find the right person. So, you know, um, yeah, that, that was my view. Uh, still hasn't changed. <laughs> Oh my, okay, here we go, part two. She's about 10, 15 years younger. Uh, she's never married, mainly because she's, uh, okay, gets bored with men who are not way smarter. Yeah, gals like to date sideways or up. I don't want to get off on a tangent on that, but uh, yeah. So, oh my gosh, your question continues. Okay, been a big fan of yours uh, because of your deep knowledge of topics, humor and that keeps going, China's treasure. Okay, <laughs> all right, well, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Um, I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> but uh, if she's in Medellin, go ahead and uh, <laughs> uh, send her info over to Adriana. I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, let's we'll, we'll move on. But thank you very much. I appreciate you. Uh, I think maybe my mom uh, wrote this text, but... <laughs> <laughs> or wrote that question. <laughs> China's treasuries at its lowest since GFC in 2008. Buffett, U.S. senators are selling TSM semiconductor stocks. It seems like China's unloading exposure because invasion. Mm, maybe. Maybe. I don't think that's outrageous. Yeah, I, I have no way of knowing. I have no insights on that other than if I was China and if I was going to invade something, that's exactly what I'd do. I would definitely dump all my dollar my dollar assets that could be frozen, especially after what happened to Russia. When I lived in Argentina and Ecuador, I heard stories of the government's freezing the people's bank accounts and taking a percentage of everyone's money. At what point should we be worried about this? Well, in Ecuador, that happened. It's just that an exit tax in Ecuador when I was there, Correa put that in. It's just insane, insane law. Or if you want to transfer your money out of Ecuador, they tax you 5% just on the gross. Um, yeah, that's, that's why you want diversification as far as your geography, your bank accounts, all those things. And in today's day and age, that's even more important. And I just never really planned more than six months out. So I really love Medellin, and um, I sure hope it stays like this, but it might not. So I just know that I'm very comfortable and very excited about living here for the next six months, and then I reevaluate based on what's happening. But I don't have all my eggs in one basket. I don't have all my money here. I don't have all my assets, and there's no way I would do that. Absolutely not. I wouldn't have all my assets in the U.S. I wouldn't have all my assets in any one jurisdiction. And if you're saying to yourself, George, what should I do? Go to Rebel Capitals Live. <laughs> I know I just talked to Robert Barnes, and I know he's going to be discussing that. And Simon Black, the sovereign man himself, is going to be there, and he's going to be discussing the exact same thing. They're going to be at the cocktail party, so you can listen to what they have to say. Go up to them, ask them questions, get to know them face-to-face, -face, tell them your personal story, and you know they can try to help you out. Gold miners getting close. I like gold here. I like gold miners. Um, I don't know that I'd buy them now. Now I just really like gold as far as just the insurance side of the portfolio. And I just like cash. I, I don't know people hate it when I say that because inflation, you're losing purchasing power and cash is trash. And, you know, people say that, the, you know, de-dollarization and all this stuff. But um, I'm just looking at that for the next six months, just based on where the yield curve is. I just want as much dry powder as possible because that yield curve is ugly. I mean, the, again, there are no certainties. There are only probabilities. But the bond market has been right like 95% of the time when it comes to these inversions. And right now, it, it is one of the worst we've ever seen. And you got to think about this. You say, well, George, that was just you know banking, Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse. That's probably what it was predicting. And now the Fed has that under control. If that were true then why is it still inverted? Why hasn't it gone steepened out? And why hasn't it gone back to normal? Basically, it's the bond market telling you that, oh, Fed's new facility and 
oh, uh, Credit Suisse was taken over by UBS. And that's basically the market just shrugging it off and saying, you central planners, you idiots. That's not the problem. You haven't fixed anything. You don't even know what the problem is. And so I'm always going to believe the market, especially the bond market, more than I'm going to believe the central planners. That's for sure. So my point is, um, I don't know what's coming, uh, but I know that the smart money is predicting something bad. And I know that if that hits, that asset prices are most likely going to go down. And that includes gold. That includes gold. That includes Bitcoin. Why? Because it's the only liquid thing on the balance sheet. Look at 2008. Look at 2020. Or 2020, rather. Um, you, you saw the same thing. When gold sold off, uh, you know, Bitcoin obviously didn't sell off in 2008, but it definitely did in 2020. So, and it makes sense. But that, that's your buying opportunity. That's your buying opportunity for sure. And, um, you know, I love commodities for the long term, but a lot of them aren't cheap. They're getting cheaper. That's for sure. And if we have a recession, if we have an economic depression, I can guarantee they're most likely again. Well, I can't guarantee you, but again, high, high, high probability that they go even lower, even if it's just kind of a knee jerk reaction. Cause I know the supply side is ex extremely constrained, but, uh, again, that's your opportunity. And the bigger the crisis, uh, the bigger the opportunity that it creates, but you can't take advantage of that opportunity unless you've got some dry powder. And so that's why I just like these short-term T-bills and the model portfolio that I have for Rebel Capitalist Pro, that's pretty much 90% you know, T-bills, short-term T-bills and 10% gold. But I guess I wait. I really went off on a tangent there. Sorry about that. To answer your question, yeah, when uh, when the stuff hits the fan, or whenever it's pretty clear what this what the bond market is predicting, and then once the Fed starts dropping rates, usually if you go back in history, when the Fed starts dropping, that's when the market really goes down. And you know why? Well, usually the Fed's responding to that, and uh, you know people think that oh my gosh, once the Fed starts dropping, the market's going to rip. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. Now, this time may be different, but those are dangerous words. Usually what happens is the Fed drops rates, it keeps dropping, keeps dropping, keeps dropping, 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 and then the market only rebounds once they get to zero, uh, and we have some fiscal alongside with the monetary. So that, that's kind of what I'm using as that catalyst. Now, you know, at that point, I'm going to look at the commodity prices, the ones that I have on the watch list, or any stocks for that matter, and say, oh, what well, looks good, what's cheap? And then I'm going to take some of that dry powder with the T-bills and I'm going to cash them in. And then I'm going to hopefully be able to get some, some good deals and then just hold them for the next 10 years. Think about moving to Philippines in seven years when I retire. But if the dollar keeps dropping, the peso will be worth. If the dollar keeps dropping. Um, yeah, I, the dollar keeps dropping. Dude, it's at 101. <laughs> That's... That's I know it's it's come down from 112, but 101 that that's that's a very strong dollar, uh, historically speaking. Um, but yeah, you've got FX risk. You definitely do. So if you don't want the FX risk, buy gold. Where do you see the BIS going next with icebreaker? I think they're just gonna pressure governments to adopt it. Wait, mm, I don't know that they'll have to pressure governments. They're probably, I mean, I, I would say yes to everything. They might pressure governments. Governments will probably want it, want to be a part of it, um, but that will accelerate significantly during the next crisis. That's for sure. Is there a relationship between duration of yield curve inversions and severity of falling recessions? I don't think so. No, no, I mean, I don't have that chart in front of me, but I use it often, and I don't recall a correlation there. What, what I'm... My view on that topic 
and why I would say that this yield curve is predicting something major is because of the rate that the Fed funds futures is predicting the Fed will drop rates. So if we just have this soft landing, the Fed is not going to likely drop rates from call it 5% straight down to zero, 500 basis points. Or the, the Fed's not even going to drop that much. So they're just going to pause, wait, see how things happen or see how things play out. And if we get some disinflation, you know, this nice soft landing, then they might take rates down 25 basis points. Or why not just leave them at 4.75 or 5? I mean, historically, that's pretty, pretty normal, right? But that's not what the market's predicting. The market's predicting the Fed is going to drop rates by 120 basis points, roughly, before 2024. So if you assume that the next Fed meeting, they're going to hike by 25, that takes you to five. Okay, so that means between, let's say, May and January, they're going to drop 125 or 100, 120 basis points. That is a massive decrease. That's not just a pause. So you have to ask yourself, what would prompt them to do this, especially when you consider Jerome Powell's legacy? And I don't think you can overstate how important this is. If you're Jerome Powell, you you have to know that history is going to remember remember you a certain way. It's either going to remember you remember you as Arthur Burns or it's going to remember you as Paul Volcker. So I think that he is definitely going to err on the side of keeping rates higher for longer, even if deep down he knows that he should pause or he should pivot. I think he's just going to rationalize it in his own head as to why he needs to continue to push that. Now, I'm not saying he's going to continue to raise rates, but I'm saying that's going to be his bias. And uh, so there, again, uh, if the market is predicting that with that bias included, that he's still going to be dropping rates by 100 basis points before the end of the year, that, that, is, that is not a soft landing. That is the stuff hitting the fan. So in that environment, I, I think it's highly, highly, highly likely that you see asset prices come down, especially the S&P. When it really gets nuts, which state would you live in? Florida. That's pretty easy. I'm in Alaska. Yeah, if you're really worried about it, because there's not too many. I mean, I don't think you're gonna have to deal with too much social unrest in Alaska. Might have to deal with some bears. That may be some social unrest that you wouldn't want to deal with. <laughs> but no human social unrest. I've been living in Mexico for the past four months, but am considering going to Colombia. Do you have an idea the economy is more stable, suited? Go no. No. I know Colombia is nicer. I know Medellin, at least Medellin. Uh, I've been all over. You know, I've been to over 45 countries. And I've been to all the nicest cities and Dubai and London and Paris and Monaco and all these places. And I can tell you that Medellin is, is the nicest, hands down. Easy, 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 easy. So now as far as from the stability of the economy, I don't know. I mean, they're doing okay now. The president's obviously crazy. So where will they be in a year or two? Who knows? But I don't know where Mexico's economy is going to be either. So again, the best advice I can give you is just do what I'm doing. And that's, you, you can't look at the world and say, hey, what place is going to be perfect for the next 10 years? That that doesn't exist. Unfortunately, that's not the, the hand we have been dealt as far as the people alive today. Now, maybe if you were alive 100 years ago, that would have been easy. But we don't have that option. So we've just got to play the, the, the cards we're dealt. And um, unfortunately, if you're someone who really values freedom and liberty, I just don't think you can make a 10-year commitment right now. I don't even think you can make a 10-month commitment. You really just try to six months at a time and go from there. I mean, look at the Cervasa sickness, for heaven's sakes. Which country was perfect? Would you have guessed Sweden out of all the countries? 
No, I don't think anyone would have guessed that. So or it was basically Sweden or St. Bart's, you choose. And, um, you know, who knows what black swan, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, you could have been in the perfect country in March of 2020. And next thing you know, you're locked up in a cage. I mean, that's, that's the way I was. I got locked down in Columbia, locked in a cage. Like, no, this does not work for me. And you guys know my story. I tried to every single thing I could to get out of Columbia. I couldn't do it. You know, in fact, it's, it's interesting because most people have never really thought down or have never really sat down and thought about this. Let's just pretend that you were a billionaire in 2020. Would that have bought you freedom? Answer, no. No. And I, I know that from personal experience. Now, I'm not a billionaire, but I have, I'm the next level down. <laughs> and I've got, I've got plenty of resources. So I, I, and my assistant, I had a fleet of people trying to get me out of Columbia any way they possibly could. I was going to charter a private jet. I was going to charter a yacht and somehow charter a helicopter up to Cartagena, get on the yacht, have the yacht take me to St. Bart's. I mean, I had all, I, I tried absolutely everything. Money was no issue. And I still couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Now, maybe if I was a billionaire, I'd know Klaus. I could just call Klaus and say, hey, dude, you got to call the president and, and get me a, a side pass here, right? Maybe I could do that, but that would that really wouldn't be money. That would be more influence. So from a standpoint of, of money, it didn't matter how much you had. You didn't have your freedom. And if you're locked in a jail cell, does it matter how much money you have? No. You're still dirt poor. You still don't have any of the things that make this life great. So my point is, if, if that can happen just at a right field so quickly, who knows what's next? So that's the best argument I can give you as to why there are no perfect countries. There, there's, there's no way you can just say, oh my gosh, this one th has the best chances of being great. Because nobody would have picked St. Bart's in Sweden. <laughs> There's just no way. But that's the way it turned out. So what can you do? Be flexible. Be flexible. That's my message. Aren't the silver and gold derivatives markets too big to fail? Wouldn't the price of both just be revalued in a new derivatives market? Mm, I'm not sure. I don't know why they would fail. Uh, maybe if people were redeeming the for the precious metal. I haven't really done too many whiteboard. In fact, I don't think I've done a whiteboard video on that. So I've never really researched it to a great degree. So, yeah, I'm just not sure why they would they would fail. If they did fail, I mean, yeah, there'd be some problems. I don't know if it would be systemic. But to be honest with you, I haven't researched it. I haven't really thought it through too much. So kind of take that answer with a grain of salt. I think, you know, I would suggest if you're really interested in that stuff, follow uh, Luke Groman on Twitter because I know he he dives into that quite a bit. Would you call the BRICS nation's attempt at using another currency fragile and untested? Sure. Absolutely. And this is something that nobody's talking about. Okay, let's just say that they tried to replace the dollar. How, how do you know it's going to succeed? Well, let's just say that they try to de-dollarize. How do you know it's going to work? How do you know their currency is going to work? You don't. So my, my point is, I don't know of any reserve currency that was implemented 
I don't know of any global reserve currency that was created by decree. Now, maybe you guys can point out one that I'm, I'm not thinking of, but I don't know that there has been one. So how does a global currency, reserve currency come about? Not tops down, bottoms up. People, entities, businesses, just start doing more and more and more business with that country. That country's economy grows, 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 grows to where more countries, more entities in those countries want to do business with the consumers, the entities in that country whose uh, economy is becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger percentage of global GDP. And the central planners don't have to say, from today on, we're using the yuan as the global reserve currency, and you have to do it. No, the market's already doing that. And so someone might point to Bretton Woods, but no, that was just the central planners coming in and saying, okay, here's how the system's going to work moving forward. But the dollar was already the reserve currency. The United States already had all the gold. Why? From doing business, from the economy growing. That's how you'd get all the gold. And that's why they could peg the dollar to it. But my point is, th this transition happened way, 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 way before 1944. And again, it, it didn't happen as a result of the U.S. president coming in and saying, darn it, we want the global recurrency or the global reserve currency. And we're sick and tired of dealing with these uh, British. And they don't deserve to have the global reserve currency anymore. So we're going to come in and just do business with XYZ country, and we're only going to trade back and forth with dollars just to show those, those British people how stupid they are, that they can't, because they've been weaponizing the British pound. No. <laughs> no. What, what happened, I maybe there's some of that rhetoric, but what really happened is the United States economy just did better and better and better and better, grow, 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 grow. And as you would imagine, if you're a business in Britain, or if you're a business in Spain or Argentina or something like that, you're, you're going to be like, wow, I'm getting all these customers from the United States. Wow, I'm having to buy so many of my inputs from the United States. Wow, I better hold some U.S. dollars. You know, kind of a no-brainer, right? But you see, again, that, that happens bottoms up, not tops down. So getting back to your question specifically, when will the dollar start to lose reserve status? I think it already has started that process. Now, it's by no means complete, but it'll just happen gradually. If the, if the world becomes more bifurcated, which it most likely will, then those BRIC companies, or BRIC countries, excuse me, and the entities within those BRIC countries will want to do more and more business with one another. And when they want to do more and more business, they'll want to hold each other's currencies. And the, regardless of what the government says, Right. And even right now, if the government comes in and says, we're going to use, you know, we're going to trade uh, oil for yuan or we're going to create a new BRIC currency. Okay. Does that mean that the entities are going to use it? Like, think about that. If they, they come in in, Tur in Turkey, let's say they're in hyperinflation and all of these entities in Turkey right now are staying afloat and uh, succeeding or prospering because they're using the dollar. They, they got rid of those stupid lira. They're not using them anymore. Okay. Well, let's say the Turkish government comes in and says, okay, we're starting a brand new currency, a brand new lira. In fact, we're going to make it, we're, we're going to do something that's never been done before. We're going to take a basket of all these currencies and throw them in here. And, or we're going to back our currency with gold. And then you just need to trust us that you're going to be able to redeem the gold and, you know, would you trust that government that just hyperinflated the lira with your entire life savings? I don't know. Or would you say, okay, government, yeah, you can go take your stupid little gold currency and pound sand. Now I might see, I might sit back and say, hey, I like that idea, but I'm going to see how it plays out. I'm going to see if you actually hold up your end of the bargain. And I'm going to maybe buy, you know, 10,000 or whatever, and I'm going to try to redeem it and see what happens. I'm going to see how hard that process is. I'm going to see if you're telling the truth because I don't trust you. 
And in the interim, I'm just going to keep using dollars because that's what I know. That's what I'm accustomed to. And that's what's easiest. You see, that's the reality of the situation, right? Now, if let's say we don't have some decree at all and Turkey creates their own gold backed currency, and I'm not saying they're going to, I'm just using this as a hypothetical. And then let's say that, that their economy really starts to grow and really starts to do well. They've got sound money. Great. So now more and more businesses are doing that. The government doesn't need to come out and say, use our currency. We're setting up a, a trade agreement with blah, 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 blah. And we're only going to settle oil in the new Turkish lira backed by gold. They don't have to do that because the market's going to just gravitate in that direction. You see, the, the central planners don't have uh, currently, you know, who knows what happens to the central bank digital currency, but the, the, the central planners don't have a, a lot of say in the currency <laughs> that a, a lot of these entities use. So th that's uh, how I would look at it. But to give you a direct answer, is it fragile, untested? Of course it is. We, we don't, it's not even, it doesn't even exist. So it, it's going to, it's definitely untested by definition. Um, but even when it, even if they start, assuming they do, it is going to be incredibly fragile. It doesn't mean it's not going to work, but it's, it's by no means a guarantee. How do the elites, World Economic Forum, work together with China? Or are they actually opposed? I think they're opposed. Yeah. That's my base case. And the reason I say that is because if you look at history, you, you see all these megalomaniacs. And let's say, say uh, Genghis Khan as an example. Or Julius Caesar or something like that. Or fill in the blank. And what are they always doing? I mean, th there is one thing that you see, or not one, but there's really like three things that you see consistently in human history that just happens over and over and over and over and over again. Number one is war, unfortunately. Number one is war. Number two is famine. Number three, disease. It's just, it's just who we are. It's part of human history. And so if you look at, you know, any of these leaders um, and you sit back and say, okay, well, yeah, Genghis Khan controlled all this territory, but how did he get it? Well, he went and battled all these other guys and he ended up winning or Alexander the Great, something like that. But do you mean to tell me that he was the only megalomaniac that was living during that time? No. Every single one of these warlords or every single one of these kings or, or whatever they were called back then that was, that was in control of this massive territory that he went to war with and that he uh, you know, took territory were just as much of a megalomaniac as he was. And they're all just competing. And you had like... You know, at certain times, you had like 10 guys that were like controlling the entire world's population. And they were trying to beat each other because each one of those guys wanted to be the king of the world. Quite literally. Wanted to be the ruler of the planet Earth. There was no limit on their insatiable lust for power. But again, it, you're telling me that Genghis Khan was the only guy? Let's just say there was 500 million people on Earth back then. He's the only one like that? What are you talking about? Not even close. So my point is now we have 8 billion people on Earth. You're going to tell me that Klaus is the only megalomaniac? He's the only guy that, that wants to take over the world. Xi Jinping doesn't want to do that. You know, fill in the blank. Nobody else wants to do that except for, for Klaus. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so that, that's why I think that and you say, well, George, why is Xi Jinping going to World Economic Forum? Why are they doing the central bank digital currency? You know, why are they doing all these things that are very in line with the Great Reset agenda? Because 
they're 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 cut from the same damn cloth for heaven's sakes they're two peas in a pod and one is going to use the other as much as they possibly can you keep your friends close and your enemies closer and that's my base case with china and the world economic forum i i think that sums it up you keep your friends close and your enemies closer Will the Fed hold individual accounts equate to monetizing the debt? No. No, those are two different things. Now, it, it may lead to that, monetizing the debt. Would that lead to that? I would, and when I say lead to that, I'm trying to think that would increase the probability of them monetizing the debt. Oh, let's see that. Buying. Uh, actually, I think that would decrease the probability. Yeah, that would decrease the probability most likely. Let me blow your mind real quick. Why would the government need to create debt? So let's assume we have a central bank digital currency real quick. And let's assume all the entities and individuals in the real economy have an account with the Fed, all in the Fed's balance sheet. And we know that the Fed's balance sheet is infinite. It cannot go bust. So why would they need to create treasuries? You say, George, well, how's the government going to spend? Easy. There's some guy at the Fed goes down into the account, and just types in a couple more zeros. Because the Fed's balance sheet is pretty much the whole entire asset side of the of the U.S. balance sheet as far as their, their cash in this world, right? And so it, the government quite literally, now they may to create clatter on all these other things, but if they didn't need to, they didn't want to, they wouldn't even have to issue debt because the, the Fed would just literally create the money. I mean, it's straight MMT at that point. So again, to answer your question, I don't know how exactly it would play out, but if I had to put money on it, I would say the probabilities actually decrease that we monetize the debt with a central bank digital currency. And I want to be very clear, uh, an individual holding an account at the Fed is the, the, the foundation of a central bank digital currency. So even if they're not calling it that, even if they're not calling it Fed coin, they still have the exact same type of leverage. They can still do the exact same types of things. So people should in my opinion, they shouldn't be so focused on a CBDC. They should be hyper-focused on individuals having an account at the Fed. Right now, it is illegal. So we need to make sure people say, oh, they're going to change the law. They're going to ignore it. I agree with you. I, excuse me. I agree with you, for sure. But we, as concerned citizens, as citizens, rebel capitalists, who value freedom, liberty, free market capitalism, we need to make sure we do everything in our power to try our best to not allow them to either break that law or change that law. All right, guys, let's go ahead and leave it at that. We'll do some shout outs. Thanks for hanging out with me. Got over a thousand people on the live stream. Want to encourage all of you to check out Rebel Capitalist Live. The conference is going to be absolutely amazing that I'm doing in Orlando, May 12th through the 14th. Incredible speakers like Peter Schiff, like Mike Maloney, Lynn Alden, Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, Robert Barnes, Sovereign Man, just to name a few, Simon Black. So you guys get your tickets ASAP, only about 25 days until the event, and you can do that at rebelcapitalslive.com. All right, let's do some shout outs here. I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me. We got An oh, Anthony's in the house. I just saw Anthony, then he disappeared. Anthony, I hope you're well, my friend. We got All Nighter Hider, Tori RR, Diversified Prepper, Ken Long, Crypto Beauty. Joseph Gerard, self-defense for kids. <laughs> Got the plug in there, Joseph. Good job. Uh, Vic McLausick, Mark N1MMO, Christina L, name, name, Martin Lee, 
Christopher Kirwan. Moody, the millennial in the house. <laughs> uh, All Nighter Hyder, I think I already said. His name, Wayne Smith, Akshar Patel, Seamus A. Ben, Spock, 2024, Gregory Stewart Baxter, Silverman, Jim Wolf. It's good to see a lot of OGs on the live stream this evening. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your evening, your weekend, and I will see you on the next video.